Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is the only standard for truth. Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on the Road to Calvary series. This will be book three. I encourage you, if you have not listened to book one and two, certainly go back and listen to those two books. But this is going to be book three. It specifically is going to target the topic of the Holy Spirit. It is entitled, Be Filled Now. Now today we'll be covering part one and part two. So I invite you to grab a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage. Take a few moments, pause this video, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and soul, to open your eyes to his truth. And let us begin part one, which is titled, Now, Not Tomorrow. Be Filled Now is more than the title of this small book. It actually summarizes in three words the heart of the message of grace to which these chapters lead. It is not be filled tomorrow when we hope we shall have improved, but be filled now in the midst of our failure and current need, as we are where we are. And after this now, the next now. Such an experience of present tense blessedness for needy people can only be possible as we are giving a new sight of the grace of God making every blessing available on street level. It is in this context we are to hear the word be filled with the Holy Spirit. The place and function of the Holy Spirit in the life of the individual believer and of the church, the body of Christ as a whole, is vastly important. If it is a basic truth of the Christian faith that no man can know God except in the face of Jesus Christ, it is also true that no man can see that face and acknowledge him as Lord except by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.3 Moreover, the apostolic injunction, be filled with the Spirit, which we are told in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, still stands binding on every believer, and he ignores it at the peril of missing the fruitfulness and joy which such fullness brings. In treating this subject of being filled with the Holy Spirit, I have avoided dealing with the matter of the gifts of the Spirit, such as speaking in tongues, healing, and and the like, which are mentioned to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, this may seem strange in view of the current widespread interest among Christians to this subject, and the fact that an increasing number in many denominations across the world now are testifying to receiving an experience of the Holy Spirit to the accompaniment of such manifestations and gifts. Any new writing on the subject of the Holy Spirit might be bound to take cognizance of this fact and have much to say about it. To omit this side may seem to make such a writing irrelevant to the current movements in the body of Christ. It even might make some feel frustrated and impatient, for this seems to be what so many want to hear about. I have, however, omitted doing so quite purposely, and that for two reasons. First, the experience of the supernatural gifts of the Spirit tends to divide Christians into two groups, the haves and the have-nots. Satan can tempt us either to despise one another or to disagree with one another. The message of the grace of God in the present tense, however, is for both the haves and the have-nots. The one who has had experience of the gifts of the Spirit may yet need to learn how to go on being filled with the Spirit when sin and falling short have brought dryness. 
in such times, the memory of great experiences in the past will do nothing to help him. Rather, it may depress him. He needs to see the grace of God perfectly adapted to his need, and that continuously, and come again as a sinner. On the other hand, the one who cannot claim to have had these experiences need not feel himself deprived on that account. The grace of God is like an ocean of water ever seeking depth, that is, need, that it may fill it. The true meaning of grace is the undeserved love of God. The emphasis must always be on the fact that it is undeserved, if grace is to be grace. That being so, the only qualification to make us fit candidates for that grace is not the possessing of this or that gift, but instead our need fully and frankly confessed. As we have said, grace makes the fullness of the Spirit available for both groups on street level, at the foot of the cross. Now, the other reason that I have omitted the discussion of these gifts is that quite obviously from Paul's writing in his first epistle to the Corinthians, speaking in tongues and the other gifts, though recognized and given their place, are incidental. They are not the heart of the Spirit-filled life. My purpose has been to leave aside for the time being that which is incidental and to share only what I see to be inward and essential. And here I write only as a learner and a fellow discoverer of the grace of God and the fullness of the Spirit. Part 2. The Holy Spirit, a Person. This chapter will be a short one and will cover ground which every instructed Christian should know. But it is necessary for us to lay the foundation, first of all, so that we can begin together. The Holy Spirit is not to be regarded merely as an influence. He is a person, the third person of the Trinity, as much a person as God the Father and God the Son. He is consistently referred to in the New Testament not as it, but as he. The one place where the authorized version refers to, quote, the Spirit itself, unquote, Roman 8.16, the revised version rightly changes in the interest of greater accuracy of translation to, quote, the Spirit himself, unquote, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In another place, the writer violates the normal principles of grammar to make sure that the spirit is referred to as a person. The passage is John 16, 13, where we have the words, when he, the spirit of truth, is come. Now the Greek word translated spirit is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. This is a neuter word, and yet, contrary to what one would expect grammatically, the personal pronoun he is linked with it. Thus, at the outset, we would bow in worship before this member of the Godhead. To him is committed the carrying out of all the designs of heaven with regard to earth. The Father has given all authority to the Son, Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. But the actual implementing of that authority on earth is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the executive of the Godhead in that capacity we see him moving and acting right through the book of Acts, which could be more accurately termed the Acts of the Holy Spirit rather than the Acts of the Apostles. We have spoken of the designs of heaven with regard to earth. The first great design is that every man who has repented of his sins and put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ should be given a second birth and be made a new creature. This is the special sphere of the Holy Spirit, for he is the agent of our new birth. John chapter 3 verse 8. He does this 
by coming personally to take up residence in the heart of the one who ventures his faith on Christ and to abide there forever. John 14, 16. So whether one falls in the grouping of the haves, speaking to the spiritual gifts, or the have-nots, at the moment of his salvation, he is filled with the Spirit. Now we are aware that there are many churches who teach in opposition to that, that the only way you give evidence to the infilling of the Spirit is through the gifts of the Spirit but they are incorrect in the fact that the Holy Spirit tells us through Paul that if you have all the gifts of the Spirit, but you do not possess love, which is the Spirit of the living God, you have nothing. So therefore, it is at the moment of spiritual conception, the new birth, that the new believer is infilled with the Holy Spirit, empowering him to overcome sin and walk in victory to his new Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Or as the old song goes, Soon as my all I ventured on the atoning blood, the Holy Spirit entered and I was born of God. This is the one thing that distinguishes the child of God from everybody else. He has received, not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit of the Almighty God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. It cannot be too clearly stated then that every man who has been born anew through faith in Christ has received the Holy Spirit. Indeed, the Spirit's presence in our hearts is said in Ephesians 1 to be the seal of that we are Christ's. When it says, in whom also, after that you believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Without this seal, Romans 8, 9 tells us, we are none of his. But the Ephesians passage tells us that the Holy Spirit is not only the seal, but also the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And earnest simply means a down payment. So the Holy Spirit in our hearts is the seal, the down payment of what is Christ and of what will be ours one day in glory. If the down payment means joy unspeakable and full of glory, what will the final installment of that payment be? Quite clearly then, The further experiences of fullness and empowerment there are for us through the Holy Spirit cannot properly be called a receiving of the Holy Spirit, for how can we receive him whom we have already received? The references in the New Testament to receiving the Holy Spirit, such as in Galatians chapter 3 verse 2, can therefore only refer to that initial receiving of the Spirit at our new birth. What then is to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? It is simply to be filled with one who is already there, in our hearts. Let me give an illustration of the difference between the Holy Spirit being initially in the believer and the same Holy Spirit filling him on a continual basis. Take up a sponge And while it is in your hand, squeeze it. In that condition, plunge it in water and submerge it. Keep it there. It is now in the water, and the water is in it, though only in a small degree. As you hold it in the water, now open your hand. And as you do, the water begins to fill all the pores which you release in this way. It is now filled with the water. In the same way, when we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and we are born anew, we are put into that sphere where the Holy Spirit is operating and the Holy Spirit comes to reside within us. That is what Paul means when he says, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Romans 8, 9. Yes, 
we are in the spirit and the spirit hallelujah is in us but that holy spirit may not be in full control of us we may yet need to be filled with the spirit in whom we have been placed just as the sponge in the water we are therefore to open up every part of our being to him given in to his conviction and yielding to his lordship and as we do so we are filled with the spirit we are not only in the spirit but now the spirit is very fully in us this is however anticipating an aspect of our theme to which we shall come later more fully in our study at this point let us pause in wonder at the glorious fact that if we come in repentance and faith to the lord jesus the holy spirit himself is in us by his spirit making our bodies his own temples well friends that's going to bring us to the end of our study today i pray that you have learned something and i think the emphasis would be this there are those who would say the only evidence of the holy spirit within a believer would be that of speaking in tongues but let me leave you with one question if speaking in tongues is of such great importance then why do we not have a record of the Lord Jesus himself speaking in such a gift? For truly he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, I love you. Again, I hope that you have been with us in book one and book two. And if so, I hope that you are anticipating great things through book three. Now, as the Lord wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.